Welcome everybody to another Royal Automobile Club talk show in association with Motorsport Magazine. Now, this is a very, very special talk show. We have today Gordon Murray. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we also have Gordon Cruikshank from Motorsport Magazine. He's our editor at large. Is that, is that right, Gordon? That's yeah, editor at large. There we go. <laughs> and Simon Aaron, thank you, Simon, for joining us today. Simon My Aaron pleasure. is our features editor at Motorsport Magazine. Um, now, Gordon, I tried to write an introduction um, and I knew it had to be very brief. I'm afraid I gave up because I, I don't think there is a way of summarising your career. Um, now, recently, though, we had an exhibition, uh, 50 years of, of Gordon Murray design. Um, I wonder if we can start this talk show um, by describing this exhibition, what it, what it meant to you, and then we'll move on to a little bit of, of your, your current activity at the moment. So let's start with the exhibition. Tell us why you did it. Well, it was for several reasons, actually, but of course the underlying reason was it's, be, it's 50 years since I designed and built my own uh, car, my first car. That was in Southern Africa, in Durban, where I grew up. And uh, I came from a motor racing family. My dad was a motor mechanic, and ever since I was six years old, I wanted to go racing. And ultimately, the only way I could go racing and afford to go racing was to design my own car and develop my own engine, which I did when I was 19, 20. And then I raced the car in 67 and 68 in South Africa before I came over to the UK. So um, it's, it's 50 years. I don't know where the 50 yeah. years has gone, but it's, <laughs> it's 50 years. So I thought that deserved celebrating. But coinc coincidentally with that, it was 10 years of our current business, uh, Golden Murray Design. Yeah. And we had several announcements to make as well. So the, the 2017, we had this wonderful coincidence of 25 years of the McLaren F1, 10 years of the business, <laughs> 50 years of my car design. Yeah. And I thought that was a pretty good excuse. Good stuff. We have a, a number of questions from our readers, which um, will, I think they will probably dominate this, this talk show. We've had more questions than we've had, I think, for any talk show in, in recent times. Um, but I think, I think if you could describe and many of our readers have said, can you explain the structure um, and, and the kind of the profile of Gordon Murray design at the moment, what it means and how the various products that our readers, I think, will know about, iStream and, and Superlight, how they spin out of the, the central business? Yeah, sure. I think we have to, to describe what iStream is and the, and the core business at the moment. I think we have to really take a step back because I've always been interested in structural composites, yep. um, aerodynamics and structural composites, my two sort of favorite subjects in racing. And uh, right ba way back in the 70s with Brabham, uh, we had the first composite rear wing, yep. which was half the weight of an aluminium wing. And then it went on through the years, first carbon brakes in 76 on the Brabham Alpha, the first carbon in a monocoque in 79 with a mm. BD48. And uh, first, and then of course the first carbon road car with the F1, first carbon clutch with the F1. But it was probably late 1990s, I was still at McLaren. Yeah. And for a long time I've been pondering about the use of uh, structural composites but in high volume cars. Okay. And bringing it down to a level where the likes of you and I could benefit from what racing had yep. brought to us if you like. And there were three major issues. There was material cost, process time, and attaching point loads to honeycomb panels. And I had to find a way of uh, solving those three problems. And iStream does solve those three problems. Yeah. So uh, Gordon Murray Design was set up 10 years ago to develop that technology yeah. and industrialize it. And our core business model is we license that technology to as many people as we can all around the world for fundamentally high volume motor cars. Yeah. TVR is probably the exception rather than the rule <laughs> uh, with just a couple of thousand cars a year. Um, the technology itself is, um, is rarely Formula One technology for the everyday motorist. It u uses honeycomb panels, mm -hmm. which are robot bonded into a very simple lightweight frame. Yeah. And we have different versions of that. The iStream uh, we developed initially was glass fiber panels with right. a recycled paper honeycomb between the two panels over a steel frame. Then we introduced iStream Carbon, which yeah. changed this, the glass to carbon fiber, and that's currently being used by Yamaha prototypes and TVR prototype. Yeah. And now the latest one, which we announced at the event, was iStream Superlight, which uses aluminium and recycled carbon. Yeah. And it's pretty affordable and, and is 
going to produce a body in white that's about 50% reduction in stamp metal. Okay, we're going to come back to the superlight, I promise. Gordon, tell me about the exhibition. I was deeply impressed. I knew there was a widespread of things to be seen, but the fact that there were 40 cars there, I don't know how you assembled all of them, <laughs> uh, in, including <laughs> all the rarities from the, uh, the Bravo Malfas, uh, the fan car, and even your original car, which I think you had to reconstruct. That's right, yeah. Can I ask about your original car? Um, when you reconstructed it, could, did you resist the temptation to make it better? Well, funnily enough, it's, it's a little bit of a hybrid because right. I had two versions. In 67, uh, when I first raced the car and yeah. hill climbed the car, circuit racing and hill climbing, um, I did well, but I wasn't happy with the motor car and I lowered it for the second year, lightened it and lowered it. <laughs> and for, so for 68, it looked quite different, although it was, right. it was the same chassis, it was cut down, if you like, um, and, and a more lay down driving position in 68. And then I had a new chassis on board for 69, but that's when I decided to leave for the UK. <laughs> so what we built was actually the 68 car with a couple of the 69 right. mods, but it's pretty accurate. Yeah. I kept all the drawings yeah. and we had plenty of photographs. The only thing that was wrong with it is that my prototype boys did a much better job. <laughs> I said to them, when you finish it, you need to kick it around the workshop a bit because it yeah. looks too good. Yeah. If, if you hadn't left for the UK when you did, do you think the um, original car would have grown a fan on the back at some point? <laughs> <laughs> I, I said I've always been fascinated with, with aerodynamics, um, which is why I lowered the car. Right. I reduced the frontal area by about 25% between 67 and 68 and went seven miles an hour quicker on the straight. But talking of keeping the records and the photos, you, you just keep everything, don't you? I do, I do. I'm yeah, told that your, your personal archive is four times the size of the motorsport office. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, for the warm-up for this, a good example is for the warm-up for this event, we decided to have a sort of a, as you know, a holding area, and we had my own classic cars yeah. in that area. And uh, one of our brand team, Jenna, said to me, why don't we have some of your T-shirts up? How many have you got? And I said, I don't know, I've been collecting ever since I've been travelling, really. And uh, I said, probably 150, 200. And she said, do you mind if we come sort them out for the event? And I said, not at all. Evidently, I've got 980. <laughs> so we had two, 200 of those up at the event. T tell me what all of the cars that were on display, tell me what they all have in common. I think, I'm, I, think I know, but I think our readers will, uh, and our listeners I, would like I, to The answer that. to that, the clue is in the name of the event. <laughs> One formula, if you, haven't, if you haven't clocked it, is, is lightweight. So that's why starting with a classic car collection and running through to the main exhibition, when you had the, the board with the description of the car, the weight was always in red. Yeah. And that's been my mantra. Uh, Chapman was my mm. hero when I was growing up as, as a teenager in South Africa. And you know, I, f I feel I'm quite similar the way I approach things to, yeah. to Chapman. Uh, can I say that there was another theme running through that exhibition? They all look good. There's not an ugly car in the whole lot. Yeah, well, that's the minibug was functional, shall we say. <laughs> well, even that, you know, I've had it's, it's square because I couldn't make curved panels in those mm. days because it's a stressed aluminium skin. But then the but ox is all square and that's well proportioned. It, it's yep, quite handsome. That's right, yeah. It, um, I think I'm, I'm highly unusual as an engineer. Normally, engineers can't even draw stickmen. You know, they're not artistic at all. It doesn't yeah. go with the territory. But I actually started in art when I was 11. I went to art school um, as an extra activity outside normal school. And I was doing art at prep school. And I had a teacher at prep school. And I was at a government school with over a thousand pupils. I had a teacher un unbelievably write to my folks and say, this guy fills his notebooks with racing car suspension mm -hmm. and electric guitars and aeroplanes. And I don't think he should be in art. So. When I went to high school, I only did a month of art and then I switched to technical drawing. Yes. Thank goodness, because I would have made a pretty lousy artist. I think. Yes. So I think, I think I have that enough artistic uh, side in me. So when I draw a car, I love styling cars. I've styled all my cars. I've led the styling team in all my cars, apart from the SLR, which was done by Mercedes or Daimler Chrysler in those days. Uh, and, and I think that's why the cars are probably slightly better proportioned than the other cars at the time. Well, it showed. Let's, um, 
Uh, you mentioned Colin Chapman mm. being being your hero. How how did you get your information as a kid growing up in the sixties <laughs> about about racing? How how did you know okay. about these guys? Well, it was through magazines. Yeah. Uh, in those Such days, a <laughs> only, yes, only <laughs> magazines. Um, but they used to come sea mail. Right. So you would get them four to five weeks after they were released in the UK. But it didn't really matter because South Africa was so isolated mm. anyway, mm. Um, not just geographically and politically, but from the point of view of keeping up to date with what was going on in the outside world, it was very colonial. Mm. And uh, so it didn't seem to matter that it was the, the, the stuff was four or five weeks late. Yeah. So I used to devour those, those mags, I mean, cover to cover. Yeah. Um, and that's when I first saw, you know, the Lotus 7, the Lotus Alain, and of course the racing cars. Yeah. And then I used to, um, from my first Grand Prix, I think it was 1959, East London, yeah. and then we used to go up to Carl Army for the Grand Prix, we used to hitchhike 400 Did miles. You? 400 miles yeah, of Yeah, before we had a car. And then we used to drive. And we also used to go to the, uh, I think it was called the Sunshine Series, where they brought the latest GT and sports cars out every yeah. winter, yeah. Uh, European winter. So there was always the latest Ferrari prototypes, Porsche 904s, 906s, uh, GTO Ferraris, uh, GT40 Fords. Mm. And, and in those days, you could mix with the people in the paddock. So, yeah. you know, it was a lot of first-hand stuff as well. So... Interesting to hear you talk about the aesthetics and the engineering of these cars. W were you, was you drawn to the to the look of the vehicle to start with, or is it, did you work your way past that and start to dig around underneath the, the skin? I mean, what, what was your that's, true that's a good question. I think I think the honest answer is it was more about the design of the car rather mm. than the, what I call styling. Right. Having said that, so many of the good cars look good. And yes. the reason why the early Lotuses look good is Chapman was e excellent at surrounding himself with, with good people. Yeah. And one of those people was Coston. And uh, Coston had a fantastic feel for aerodynamics and for shape. And if you look at all the early Loti, um, a lot of them are Coston cars. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and they look really good. And I think Chapman himself had a pretty good feel from an engineering point of view. Um, but also from an aesthetic point of view. And things like, I mean, a good example is the Lotus 25, you know, the first monocoque yeah. uh, racing car. Beautiful little thing. I st you still look at them today, and it's just so beautifully proportioned. Yeah. So even though it was probably the design that attracted me and the step forward, it sort of went hand in hand with good-looking cars too. And generally, it was true. If you go right back to the 50s, you know, the cars that made breakthroughs, and cars like the Lancia D50, the, the cars that were different, but they all, mm. the proportions were always really, really good. Yeah, which we don't see in Formula One today. We, we see no, but well it's very aero driven <coughs> now, isn't it? But I, but I think also in the old, in the old days, those cars were usually single people, person yeah. cars, or yeah. they were a very small group of people. So, if you had somebody like Mauro Fagieri doing a, the, the 2016 OSP, beautiful little car. Mm. You know, they w the people would do the body and the chassis and the suspension. And I think that holistic design led to good looking cars. They were also good mechanically. Yeah. So what can we expect then of the, the super light? It's, it's, it's the car of the moment and we've, we've seen a, a single kind of mysterious sketch and everybody's looking at this sketch going, has it got an air box? Is it, how, how big is it? Well, I'm sure you can give yeah. us a number of exclusives here. Te God. Teasers are fun, aren't they? Yeah. Um, I think we have to, again, take a little step back. Um, we're not starting a car company. I don't want to start a car company at 71 years old. What we are starting is an automotive business, and there's a subtle difference. Um, it's all on the basis and on the back of iStream Superlight. So while we're at the moment we're only licensing the technology, yeah. I thought what a, what a nice step forward it would be to actually come up with a few platforms that so people can actually license the platform. So you cut out of the time scale for the customer all the, you know, the concept design and the going through all that, those loops before you actually get to a rolling chassis, if you like. And because the body on iStream is non-structural, one platform could have several different bodies on it. So then I started thinking, okay, well, if we're going to make our own uh, platforms, why don't we make a few limited editions of our own car? Mm -hmm. And if you want to start with something that grabs people's attention, do a headline, 
do a headline car. Yeah. And it sort of falls in line with after the F1, you yeah. know, 25 years ago. For the last five years, I've been thinking I've probably got one more good sports car in me. And what a great opportunity to do it using our new technology yeah. and launch the car company with it yeah. and relaunch the IGM brand, which is yeah. now 50 years old. So again, it was, it was a matter <coughs> of all the stars aligning, if you like. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's why we announced the, the teaser in the car. Yeah. I was very impressed that you had the steering wheel from the T1 car, the original car. Yeah, that's all that remains. With the IGM <laughs> logo on it. Yeah, it was cut. It was badly cut. The IGM logo was badly cut out of vinyl, I think. <laughs> Fablon or whatever it's called in but those still, days. That's but a bit, that's a bit yeah. of dedication to carry that through for 50 years. Yeah. And finally produce the car. It's wonderful that we've got a brand that, you know, we don't have to invent a new brand. We've got a brand that's already 50 years old. Yeah. Okay, we, we are going to jump around all sorts of eras, I'm afraid, due to the questions and probably the way our minds work. But um, um, if we go back this time um, to, to when you came over to the UK, um, you had a job offer from Colin Chapman, didn't you? And that, yes. But it didn't work out the way you, was, you, no, you expected. No, I was, um, <laughs> again, you know, you feel rarely isolated when you're, when you're 7,000 miles away in the Southern Hemisphere, but I... I wrote, I wasn't thinking about racing at all. I thought, okay. you know, even, even on the back of doing my own engine and car yeah. and having some success in racing, I thought there's no way, you know, a 21 year old or whatever's going to get a job in racing. So I thought Lotus Cars or Lotus Engineering, as it was called then, um, that would be a good starting point. So I wrote to mm -hmm. Colin, got a really nice letter back saying, uh, sounds like we could use somebody, not actually a job offer, we could okay. use somebody like you would you write to a chap called Brian Luff in vehicle engineering, which was the car business, uh, which I did. And Brian said, when you get over to England, come for an interview. So it wasn't actually, we have a job for you, but it was, sounded pretty good. <laughs> and I think the last letter, I honestly can't remember the exact time, but I think the last letter was about three months before I left for the UK. Yeah. On my second day in the UK, I went up to Hethel and to meet Brian, but I, he said, <laughs> Uh, haven't you been reading the newspapers? You know, there's a recession. We've just laid off, you know, quite a few people. And look at all those cars out there. They're unsold. And mm -hmm. that was the end of that. Um, how much time did you... Uh, I know it didn't, it didn't quite work out at Lotus, but how much time over the subsequent years did you spend with Colin Chapman? I'd like to get an idea of the conversations that you had when you were sharing a, a glass of wine. Well, <laughs> I, Colin was understandably aloof. Mm -hmm. um, he wasn't that sort of guy, actually, but I mean, he was a very important guy in Formula One. I started traveling at the end of 72, yeah. beginning of 73. And I was, I was a kid, you know, I was running, a, looking back, I was running a Formula One team when I was 26, yeah. and, um, which is quite frightening now, looking back. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I was the new kid on the block, and mm. I, I think the first year I might have got a nod from Colin, but that was it. Mm. I wouldn't dare to go up and start a conversation. Whereas some of the other team owners were far more approachable. I got to know Ken Tyrrell very well quite early on and, uh, and drivers, of course, Jackie mm. Stewart and people like that, I got to know, um, but not Chapman until one year later at Watkins Glen when we f were first and second on the grid with the BD44 yeah. and first and second on the race and I think fastest lap and second fastest lap. And after the race, I was walking back to the, the sort of shed where we worked and Chapman was approaching me and he squared up in front of me, put his hand out and shook my hand and he said, that's the way to do it. And that night I wow. got a job offer from him through a third party. Yeah. I was just wondering if you still had the letter from Chapman. I, I have the letter from Chapman. Uh -huh. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do you know where everything is in this archive thing? Well, it was until uh, six months before the event, just stashed away in the top of one of my barns at home. But the girls have come over and sorted it all now and it's all properly archived and date order now, so. Good. And, and what made you decline the job off from, from Chapman? Good question, because I thought, even at that young age, I thought probably Chapman and I were too alike. Um, I was very, very bolshy in those days and very uh, autocratic <laughs> and uh, I, I knew what I wanted and got my own way and I was, I was the only designer in the office so I had nobody to argue with and Bernie gave me a completely free hand 
And I looked at Chapman and I thought he's probably pretty much, from what I've read, pretty much the same. And I could just see a lot of headbanging. I'd already had some stand-up discussions with Ron Tornak at Brabham about suspension geometry and bump steer and Ackerman and stuff like that, stress calculations. And uh, I thought we'd spend most of our time arguing rather than getting on with the job. And that's why I declined, actually. Did, um, I, 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 I've read um, something last night doing, doing some, some research that when um, Bernie came in to, to look at buying Brabham, Ron suggested keep everyone else on the design team apart from yourself, and Bernie did the opposite. Is that, is you that know what? I've never <laughs> got to the bottom of that. Right. I have had so many people claim honestly at least four people have claimed that it was them that said to bernie <laughs> keep gordon and i've asked i've asked the old boy himself i said to bernie why did you keep me yeah and he's never once said it was somebody that said to me he just said it's something i did i got rid of everybody and kept you whether somebody one of the four people that have said it was them did have a word with them or not i have no idea um, but I don't believe the Ron Toranek story because Ron and I got on very well mm. and Ron knew that I was, unless he wanted to try and scupper the, the <laughs> ship or something, because I was the one in the office that did nearly all the stress calculations right. and the aero work yeah. and I did, I, I designed most of the car, you know, yeah. so um, I don't think it would have been Ron. Okay. Let's, let's talk about the, the, the Bernie era at Brabham. What, what did he give you um, that allowed your creativity to, to run free? I mean, you mentioned how you, you still have the mind of, or the, the kind of personality in many ways of an artist, but often the artist needs the space to be able to, to work. What, what, what did Bernie do to make sure that he could get the best out of you at that time? But Bernie quite simply gave me a free hand and trust, and that's all you need. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, if you think you have the ability to uh, run the team and design the cars, and develop the cars and engineer the cars, uh, that's what you need. You need somebody that trusts you and somebody that doesn't interfere with the design of the cars, which Bernie never did. Right. Um, and although we had a very small budget, funnily enough, in the 70s and even the 80s, having a free hand was much more important than a budget. Okay. Because it was a, it was a period where you could innovate in big steps and make big steps forward. Nowadays, you need the budget because you need to pour masses amount of people and energy into, into micro yes. changes yeah. to get a performance gain. In those days, all you needed was a good head on your shoulders and some ideas, yeah. and you could go second a lap quicker. Yeah. But you also needed immense confidence that what you were doing was right. How did you have you, that at I, such a young age? You know, honestly, Gordon, I look back and I, I'm more terrified now, you know, and I look back and I think 26, 25, 24 I was designing cars, but 26 I was running the team when he made me technical director. And I should have been terrified, um, but I wasn't. So all I can think of is, and I don't know this is right, but all I can think of is that I must have had a massive amount of confidence and self-belief in those days. Um, and as I said, I was, I was much more bolshy in those days. I was, so <laughs> I was probably <laughs> a bit sort of forceful. But um, then the results <coughs> began to yeah, yeah. I mean, reinforce your thoughts. Yeah, the first car, the BD42, the first race, it, it led. Yes. Well, were you surprised that Bernie gave you so much freedom? I mean, you say that Chapman was an autocrat. I mean, Bernie uh, wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't known for uh, you know, taking other people's opinions on board, was he? I mean, he, he himself was a bit of an autocrat. Yeah, but Bernie's very shrewd. Bernie's a very, very clever guy. And uh, what, what happened was when he bought the team we had a real and this is why i think he got rid of the, the design team we had a real melange of cars we had uh, we had a bt37 which was a ralph bellamy's last car which was a bit of a sort of a bitzer we were running a bt34 the lobster claw and i think or a couple of 40, we had a real me mess anyway. So every race we had different cars, different amounts of spares. We had Graham Hill driving for us. And B the one thing Bernie doesn't abide is not winning. You know, whatever he does, he wants to win. And we had a terrible season in 72. I think we got eight points or something, you know. And Bernie came to me and said, right, I had enough of this. It was driven by that rather than by me. It was driven by the failure 
and that was the important thing. He came to me and he said, I would uh, got rid of the other guys. You're it. I don't want to use one part of the old cars. I want a completely brand new Grand Prix car for the 73 season. And we're starting again. And that was the driver. And if you think about it, that's Bernie perfectly. And he knew to, to get the best out of me, he should let me get on with it. Uh, a, a year later, the, the, the BT44, it nearly won its first race, didn't it? Yeah, Is that, that led right? its first race too. Yeah. It was leading yeah. by 35 seconds and it ran out yeah. of fuel on, on the last lap. Yeah. It's going to sound a slightly odd question, but did, do you get the same kick out of winning that you see in the most competitive racing drivers, such as th 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 that, that kind of rage to win that we hear Absolutely. about? Did you feel that? Absolutely, right. yeah. I w I've never been interested in second or third in yeah. anything and I don't just mean racing I just right I mean it's like the when I don't did play it. cards with <laughs> no I'm very competitive <laughs> I am extremely competitive and have been all my life yeah okay um oh we're gonna have to dive into the question is there are so many and actually the Brabham era is 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 is, is, is clearly a very important one um the first three aren't actually questions, but there are, there are thanks. We have from a Mercurius, Oscar, Matsarath and Leone. I don't have a question, but it would be nice if you could say thank you to Gordon Murray for BT52. That's it. Well, <laughs> that's very nice. <laughs> and another chap says, Oscar says, me too. The BT52B is surely the, surely the most glorious looking machine ever made anywhere, ever. Good grief. So more than Spitfire, well. Concorde, <laughs> I mean, you know, Strat. Well. That's <laughs> um, but what we'll do is we'll go into, this is a good one from Alex Bremer. In this age of CAD, do you still see value in starting a car design with a pencil? Well, that's a really good one because I, I do. Um, in my office, I have a 2.2 meter drawing board and I still use the old uh, two millimeter lead Pentel clutch pens, okay. pencils, and pens that I used to use in the, in the 60s. And I love drawing. Yeah. Um, for a few reasons. It's a very good question, actually, because firstly, I love drawing, and I, I, I've got 60 people next door that are very good at CAD, so <laughs> we're learning CAD at this stage, it's not an option. But m more importantly, um, for concept design, yeah. CAD is useless. It's completely useless because CAD does straight lines and circles and joins the dots. And you cannot do a concept for a car on CAD. We never employ anybody that can't sketch, mm. whether they're 60 or whether they're 20. Um, everybody should be able to sketch. Um, because you start, uh, well, I start with just really just putting the major masses in the right place and then working a concept around that long before a shape of a vehicle takes place. Yeah. It's just working on the major masses and shifting around. And pencil and paper is a really good way of doing that. I mean, a good example was the ox, the truck. Yeah. That was two weeks work on a drawing board. And if you look at my concept sketches and the truck, there's almost no difference. One and the same, yeah. I'm gonna try and link the drawing board to the to the early Brabham's, the very triangulated shapes on, on the, the, the early cars, they don't necessarily suggest a freehand drawing style. What, what was the... Yeah, that's again quite a good question, but I, I think if you look at the BT42 and 44 bodywork, it is yeah. very swoopy. Yeah. And I had a favourite French curve, <laughs> which I called the whale. <laughs> I think it was number six, number six or number nine, I can't remember. And virtually every Brabham was drawn with that French curve. With the number six. Yeah, it's a parabolic curve. Yeah. And uh, the triangle was for a completely different reason. The triangle was to aerodynamic primarily, but also to lower the center gravity of the car and to match up the DFE head angle with the main load pass to take a lot of weight out of the rear of the chassis. Okay. So that was a necessity rather than an aesthetic right. uh, uh, reason. So I mean, if I'm going to go through all the Brabham designs looking for that number six curve. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Did you use it on the F1 as well? The F1? Uh, yeah, I did. You did? Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a question here about the... Um, let's have a look. Well, the, the fan car is... It, I, I honestly think that if we, if, if, if we asked our readers to pick their single favourite Formula 1 car, it probably would be the fan car. And it's yeah, I need to do a book on it one day, I think. What, what is... <laughs> I mean... Get a sense of to ask you, what is it about the fan car that has so captured the, the imagination? I think 
I, I, I think it's the fact that it's so wild yeah. and so sort of in its own time in 70s sort of sci-fi yeah um which was unusual in racing i mean you you had big steps forward like the first monocoque and stuff but the car still looked the same you had uh you know the first uh the 49 first car to use the engine structurally but the car looked the same mm -hmm. i think the fan car was so dramatically different visually and then coupled with that the fact it went on to win its first race yeah it's a bit yeah. like the f1 yeah. winning Le Mans. the yeah. f1 would be well known now i'm sure well, i hope it would mm. be but it's even more well known because it won Le Mans. and yeah. i think the fan car the fact that went and blitzed lotus yeah you, who had the the wing ground effect and sliding skirts <laughs> yeah i wonder if the legend would be the same if it if it continued if the car had its two or three years or whether part of its legend um, is I, I tell you what the the following year they would have had to ban them anyway because really? we had a i had a bt47 fan car already on the drawing board with twin fans with variable pitch blades and and we would yeah. have pulled you know massive g-force yeah um would the tires have coped with that no they, would, they would, <laughs> no they would have we had to run higher tire pressures on on the yeah. fan car um and and they would have had to change the sidewall construction right yeah we, we have a question um and i can't find it now but i know what the question was it was um what was what um, what was the level of downforce that was created um when the fan car was at idle when it was just sat there what well, the difference that's a again a very good question the difference between the fan car and and a normal um car with conventional wings or the lotus which was called wing cars where the actual side pods were the wing and sealed with sliding skirts um those cars um the downforce you generate it's like drag goes up with the square of the speed yeah so in hairpin corners, uh, you're producing virtually nothing. And in those days, probably in a second or third year corner, you were developing a few hundred pounds. And in a high speed corner, probably around, I don't know, a ton, yeah. 1500 pounds or something like that of downforce. The difference with the fan car, because the suction and the downforce wasn't speed dependent at all. Yeah. It was engine dependent. So we could produce maximum downforce standing still, which meant you could get a 2G start. Uh, and we had titanium drive shafts. 2G start? Yeah. Yeah, because it was producing more than its own weight and downforce. So you could stick it on the ceiling with the engine at 12,000 revs and it wouldn't fall off. Did you try that? <laughs> I'm glad you <laughs> would have been, would have been a great stunt. <laughs> Funny enough, whenever I do a lecture now, I put the fan car slide in the wrong way around, upside down, and people think it's a mistake. A so Does that mean that the uh, drivers would have to learn the technique of, of balancing engine revs and it's, suction? I tell you what, um, it, it took a lot of explaining. Nicky got it relatively quickly. We were testing a brand's hatch. And I had to say to the drivers, you have to choose gear ratios, forget the normal um, power out on, on torque band, you know, every, every normally aspirated uh, racing engine. You select the right gear going into the corner, so just after the apex, you're right in the middle of the torque curve, and then you start getting the maximum amount of push out of the corner. So the ratio is slightly longer than you would expect and that's every racing car that's ever been made that's what you have to do and you build up out of the corner up to maximum power revs and change to the next gear with the fan car you were one or one and a half ratios lower so you went into the corner already at maximum revs before you even aimed at the apex so you braked and changed down and you were at 12,000 revs already then you feathered the throttle around the corner and then change gear once you were out of the corner. To in the grip and level. then you had maximum downforce. And it, I tried to explain to the drivers <laughs> that, that it took a lot of getting used to. But when Nicky got it, he, he was, you know, it was like a revelation. It was like, now I see what you mean. But that came, with, that came with a big danger because they had so much more downforce than a conventional car. If you arrived at a corner, we were cornering, like Paddock Ben, we worked out, we were probably 25 miles an hour quicker than a conventional car going into the corner 25. 25 miles an hour and if the driver arrived at the corner and the skirts were damaged and he didn't have suction he would just fly off the road so we went out to an aircraft breakers yard and bought an altimeter or two altimeters 
And that's why the tank, tank car has a pitot tube on the front. Uh, the pitot tube is static pressure, obviously, and that goes to one side of the altimeter. And then we had another, the other side of the altimeter, because an altimeter just measures pressure differential yes. to give you altitude, goes to the underside of the car. And we had a green zone and a red zone. And I said to the drivers in, when they started Sweden, forget the numbers on the altimeter. If you're flying into a corner, make sure the needle's in the green. If it's in the red, back off because you've broken a skirt. And Nicky said he drove the whole race staring at the altimeter. <laughs> <laughs> forgot the rev counter. <laughs> was just staring at the altimeter every time he went into a corner. That has to be the only F1 car with an yeah. altimeter. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. It, it, interesting to, to compare that with your thoughts earlier on about Bernie giving you complete trust. Nicky must have placed the same complete trust in you to yep. know that this was going to work because if it didn't, obviously it was catastrophic for him. So yeah. what, what, what is it about his makeup or maybe what, how did you I give think him the confidence? I think it was beyond Nicky. I think the right. drivers, I think you have to build up that okay. if, you know, if you have a reputation for the cars failing or breaking, yeah. um, as Lotus did, Lotus did. Yeah. Um, yeah. it's very difficult to get driver confidence. But Brabham, the cars were, by and large, very solid and very reliable. Um, I did all the stress calculations myself, and the cars were light, but they were safe. Yeah. And, and no matter who the driver was, you need to do that to build up the confidence. Having said that, to jump into the fan car and drive it completely differently yeah. with that much downforce must have taken a lot of courage. Shades of Lacking learning right. to deal with a blown diffuser later on. Yep. Some people could, some people couldn't. Yep, exactly. Yeah. What, what was the process whereby Brabham eventually voluntarily decided to withdraw the fan car? Oh, that was was just because you thought it was going it was going to be banned sooner or later? No, or no, 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 that was all political. So uh, Daryl Chunky Chapman could see his championship disappearing with Andretti because they had mastered, well, I don't know if they mastered it, but they had discovered the wing car and had, you know, massively more downforce than a conventional wing car. And they were going to win the championship um, easily. Uh, and then the fan car came along and it was pretty obvious to Chapman that every race we won, we, and we were only halfway through the season, so every race we won, we would have won. Uh, every race we finished, I beg your pardon, we would have won. So uh, he was absolutely trying to whip up a storm in Sweden. He told Andretti to go around to the other drivers and say the car was chucking stones out the back. <laughs> the fan <laughs> flux was only 55 miles an hour. And of course the fan chucks things centrifugally, not rearwards mm. so it was incapable of throwing stones but he went around tr whipping up the story that didn't work and then uh, they came along after the race and they sealed the car uh, with a lead seal and they sealed the authorities they sealed the truck made us put the car on the truck and sealed it and they came around afterwards with an anemometer and they measured more more than i'd calculated actually they i calculated 55 percent of the air for cooling and 45 percent for suction and they got 60%, nearly, I think 58, 59, I got the letter somewhere, um, for cooling and the rest for suction. And wrote me a letter and said that we can run the car till the end of the season. Uh, but then they would change Article 3.7 and we you couldn't run it the next year. So I said to Bernie, fantastic, that's the championship, done and dusted. But then Chapman got Tyrrell and a couple of the other constructors, got them all together. And they wrote Bernie a letter and they said, if you continue to run the car, that's the end of the Constructors Association. And Bernie was just gaining traction, just gaining traction. And he could see that disappearing. So Bernie came to me and said, what do you think about with Trent? I said, I know what I think. I want to win the championship. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but eventually, you know, he talked me into it and we withdrew the car. So we chucked away the championship, but Bernie went on to do good stuff, so. Yeah. Yeah. In a way, that's one of the things that makes the fan car so special. There was sort of, there's a rather grand gesture about saying we were <laughs> yes. way ahead, but we're going to step back and, and let the rest of you find it out. And yet so many books and magazines that it got banned, you know. Yes. It, it didn't get banned. No. Yeah. Withdrawn. Okay. I have to thank John Smith, uh, thank John Smith for the question on the downforce numbers uh, for the fan car on, on static. So thanks to John for that one. Um, the last question on, on the fan car from me. If, if, you, if, if you had the opportunity to brief Alfa Romeo or Ford or, or any engine supplier 
for a fan car, what would the spec be? Because you, you took an engine off the shelf, and am I right in saying that part of the reason the fan car existed was because of the, the layout of the Alfa Romeo engine, mm-hmm. hadn't it? But if you were to do a BM, you know, to go to the BMW as you did with the F1 and say, right, I need this engine, what would have been your perfect spec for a fan car engine? Well, actually, with the fan car, the shape and size of the engine makes no difference at all. Okay. Uh, because you, you've got peripheral skirts. The BT47, the next generation fan car, was a big square box, more like a chaparral. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we had more underfloor area and, as I said, twin fans yeah. and variable pitch blades, so we didn't use the horsepower down the straight. Um, you could feather the fans on the straight. Yeah. Um, it's not the shape, but what you would do is run completely different valve timing. So your camshafts would be completely different in a fan car engine. Right. So instead of having aiming for maximum torque yeah. and balancing that with the power, because that's all compression ratio and uh, brake mean effective pressure and camshaft timing, timing, what you would do is make sure that there was a much wider band of torque higher up the rev range. Right. So make the engine much more peaky. Right. So forget about the low speed torque yeah. altogether. Yeah. And, and redo the cam so that the power, you had a wider range so the driver could accelerate more during the corner yeah. and still have the downforce. Yeah. That's, that, I was just trying to think whether that would be a two stroke. Very light. Yeah, could be. But I looked at a two stroke ones. Tell us more. We, well, in the old days, you had. I looked at a gas turbine as well. Okay. For, uh, for F1? Yep. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah, I, went to, I flew across to Van Dorn. Yeah, uh, but in those days we needed a CVT for a turbine because you had to run it between 100 and 105 percent all the time. Mm. And Van Doren was the firm who produced the the DAF. That's the right. That's system. right. But at the time, because they had a steel belt, right, which had steel rollers, which took the end force, and I thought, great. So I went across, flew across, and had a look at it. But it, they couldn't do more than 150 horsepower at right. that time, so I abandoned the turbine. Right. Uh, it was a very light engine. It's 600 and something shaft horsepower. Right. So I abandoned that. But then I worked with a chap, trying to remember his name, begins with E. Ertl, maybe? Anyway, two stroke yeah. uh, champion. And we looked. How old Ertl? I think How old Ertl? Ertl? Yeah, sidecar yeah. chap. Oh, no, it wasn't no, him. No, 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 it was two stroke chap. Um, two stroke expert. Yeah. And we looked at doing a flat 12 with three four cylinder engines joined together. <laughs> Um, two stroke. Um, the fuel consumption was dreadful, but the power was fantastic. Uh, yeah. But when we looked at the size of tanks we'd have to right. have, um, it was marginal whether we could get enough fuel in the car, so we didn't. Would all the power have been between about 12 and a half and 12.8 yeah, or something? Yeah, in those days, yeah. On, yeah. Yep, yep, on carburetors, <laughs> absolutely, yes. But can you imagine the sound? Oh, there you go. 12 yeah. cylinder two stroke. Oh, the mind boggles. Okay, um, I, I, I keep saying I'm going to go into the questions. I am going to go into the questions now. We, we, we're getting um, distracted. This is from a chap who's just given his name as B. How do I put a deposit down for your new supercar? <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had lots of letters <laughs> about that. Um, we, we are, to be polite, we're collecting and collating those uh, letters in, in the order that we receive them. Yep. But I did say at the time when we announced the car that this time I would put myself under no time pressure whatsoever. Yeah. I've spent my whole life up against deadlines and it, I think it's about time we did something at our speed and when we, when we have the right resource in place and the right team in place. And we've only just announced the building. The building needs kitting yeah. out. We'll kit that out next year and then we'll have a look at it. So we have no time scale. So uh, we're way off collecting deposits. <laughs> But we are, to be polite and to be correct, we are collecting and collating the names and answering people who have written in. Okay. Uh, how do you divide your time? I mean, if, if you were to apply a percentage of your time that, that you know, is div- divided up onto various projects, how, how, would you, how would you split that up at the moment? Unfortunately, I would say it's uh, in GMD, even though I have a very good team of people running the business, I have an operational board with six members who run the yeah. business. Um, I've sort of moved sideways to chairman now, but even so, that was for, to free myself up to do more design. I would say I'm probably two thirds business, one third design. Okay. And my my goal in the next three years is to reverse that. Okay, yeah. There we go. Um, okay, I say, 
we're gonna, we are going to jump around like crazy now. Um, should active ride suspension be brought back into F1? A question from at Strike Engine. No, active ride suspension. absolutely not. I think anything that complicates the cars even further and has reliability issues and takes away driver input, let's say, uh, from the performance envelope point mm. of view, uh, I don't like. I, I'd like to see Formula One getting back to being more of a driver's championship. Okay. What What do the drivers need from their vehicle to make it a driver's championship? Then I they mean, need far. They, they need there. no interference from the pits. Okay. So no at all. radio. No, no. No. I mean, no half information from the car to the pits. No, nothing. Okay. Nothing. That's absolutely top of the list, uh, which would get rid of probably a quarter of the budget as well. I mean, these days. You know, the gear changes are all selected on a simulator before they leave for the circuit. Uh, you've got a massive team of people back, not only at the circuit, but back, back at base, making decisions all the way through the race. And uh, the driver has, still has to have a lot of natural ability, but it's a bit point and squirt. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't like that. Do you think the cars are quick enough? Yeah, I think from a speed point of view, they're, they're quick enough. They don't sound good enough, in my humble yeah. opinion, but they, yeah. they're quick enough. Can I just, do you think the speed element is important? And I ask that because, as a, an example, this year, pole position at the Circuit of the Americas, Formula One, Lewis Hamilton was a one minute 33.8, I think, something mm -hmm. like that. MotoGP, same circuit, Mark Marquez, I think pole was a two minute, two point something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's about a 30 second difference, same at Silverstone. And I know which is more dramatic to watch. And well, it's actually, not the faster one. Yeah, but that's, that's my point. Speed mm. is actually irrelevant. Formula One only needs to be quick enough so that it is still the quickest, quickest. formula yeah. of that sort of, of circuit racing. Mm. That's it. Um, it's perceived speed that's important for the public that are watching. If you look at a 1960s race for the, you know, the one and a half litre formula with the little V8s? If you look at a bit of film, of that formula, I and mean, those cars had very little horsepower, 180 horsepower. They look so quick because they're drifting and sliding, and you can see the driver fighting. And there's no Re runoff area. Relative so to a car that's probably going 50% quicker around the corner, mm -hmm. but on rails, and the perceived speed, you'd always choose the, the 1960s car. And uh, I had a lot of people, uh, getting back to the exhibition, we had a little film running in each section and the 1970s film, I had a lot of people standing around me going, oh, look at that, people drifting and sliding and correcting. So it's perceived speed. The actual numbers aren't that important. Mm. That's what makes the heroes in the sport as well, isn't it? Yep. I, think, I think you can imagine a, a youngster watching Formula One today, mm -hmm. the car accelerating, braking, turning, and him thinking, well, that's mathematical, maybe I uh, can do that. Yep. You, you ask the same person to watch one of the top drivers at Goodwood in a lightweight E-type in the wet, and you're thinking, could never do that. Could never do that. Yeah, I was watching some vintage sidecars at Cadwell a few <laughs> weeks ago, and the cor I could probably corner some pl uh, places more quickly on my push bike. But they look, you know, the poor old passengers somewhere several feet off the ground, and the things flexing and twisting. And as a spectacle, the drama. Absolutely. It's fantastic. Yep. Even yep. though the cornering speeds are minuscule. And the same goes for the noise. People yeah. expect yeah. racing cars to be noisy. You need yeah. to be slightly scared, I think, when you stand next to a Formula One car yeah. and starts up. You need yeah, to be yeah. Absolutely. I was scared watching the vintage sidecars. Well, I bet you were, yeah. <laughs> How important is the idea of a championship? The Jenks used to argue that it should just be a series of races and you only campaign for one race at a time. I think from a public perception, they love champions, don't they? And they love to champion champions. They like following people. And, you know, I think, I think we've forgotten that Formula One was started primarily as a driver's championship mm -hmm. and the constructors sort of came along as a secondary cup. And now the emphasis um, is, is oh, so much on aerodynamics and the engine. I mean, every decade, since 1950, since we started having World Championship Grand Prix races, there's been five elements you need to win a race and a championship. And the emphasis changes every decade. And the current emphasis is far, far too much for me mm. on engine and aerodynamics. Okay, um, 
Rene Klaus and Alex Wakefield. Rene Klaus asks, do you still own that Jimi Hendrix t-shirt I saw you wearing some 35 years ago? I do. <laughs> that's, that's one of the 980, <laughs> evidently. <laughs> he then goes on to say, um, have you ever been approached by Ferrari to become their chief designer? Um, and Alex adds to that, um, what driver did you want to work with, but you didn't have the opportunity to? Answer to the first question is yes. Mm -hmm. And second question, dri it depends whether you're talking about drivers in my time or just drivers. I would have loved to work with Jimmy Clark. I just would have given anything to work with Jimmy Clark. Because he was but your hero or because he, there was something in the way he drove? No, so no, because it's the way he drove. Okay. You could put, when you see somebody that jumps out of a saloon car into a Formula yeah. 3 car, into a Formula 2 car, into a Formula 1 car, and then an Indianapolis car or a Galaxy, Lotus huh. Cortina, yeah. and, and, and can handle that engine characteristic and that chassis characteristic, vehicle dynamics characteristic, wow, I would have liked to work with somebody like that. Yeah. Um, of the current, of my, of your, my yeah, yeah. era, yeah. Um, just trying to think. I would have liked to work with Jackie Stewart, who I only overlapped with one year, I think, one or two years in the beginning. Mm, ten, yeah, but I would have loved to work with Jackie. I used to sit in 73, used to sit, 73, 74, sit with Jackie and talk about how he focused on the first lap. I mean, the guy mm. on the first lap, he was amazing. He used to come around a mm. second and a half in the lead. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how do you do that? Yeah. You know? um, Drivers yeah. are still only figuring out today that you need to do that. Yes. <laughs> yes. Get it at the start and then that's... Yeah, that's yeah Jackie up. would have been fun. Okay. Can I flip back to the Ferrari question? Yeah, I was when getting you were <laughs> You know, I can't... I, I think it might have been more than... It was always indirect, a bit like the Lotus offers. Um, I think it might have been more than once, but it was probably seven, 70s, I think, yeah. And then, and then later sometime. But I got lots of offers from lots of people. Yeah. You had to be very careful working for Bernie. Uh, you didn't accept these offers because, you know, you didn't know what was going to happen. Yeah. Okay. The McLaren era now. So um, another question from this chap who's labelled himself as B minus. Did you work on any F1 cars for McLaren during the Adrian Newey era? No. That was there was no crossover there. No, no, no. Adrian okay. joined a few years after I stopped. Actually. Okay. Yeah. Um, from Andreas, I read conflicting accounts of whether you or Steve Nichols are responsible for the oh McLaren MP44. What really happened? That old, that old. <laughs> oh dear, that, I tell you what. There's, there's another I have to ask, there's a few There's of so much rubbish <laughs> being written about Steve Nichols and the MP44. I joined McLaren as a technical director. I said to Ron, I, I, I was going to stop. I think it's well known I was going to stop it in 17 years at Bradman and I thought that was enough. And I wanted a new challenge. But Ron was very persuasive, Ron Dennis. He just lost John Barnard to Ferrari. And uh, I said to Ron said, oh, you can come and you can do this and you can do that. I said, I'm if I come, I'm coming as technical director. I don't just want to be in charge of design. I want to be in charge of anything technical in the company. Building up the, for example, building up the composite shop, new autoclaves, mm. um, redesigning the test team, building new test rigs, torsional test rigs redesigning completely the way the team ran, um, lifing systems, yeah. everything. And I wouldn't have gone, you know. And it's, it's quite ludicrous, really. I had, to, I, had to, I had so many cars to design it. At, um, we were doing a mule car to test the little V6, a Honda 1.5. The MP43 was already finished right. when I arrived. I arrived in October 2000, uh, 86 I think it was 86 yeah and that car and that had been designed by a group of people led by Steve Nichols but it actually it was just an update of Barnard's last motor car and uh, so I had nothing to do with that at all we did take one and stuff the 1.5 V6 in the back as a test mule but then I had um, in in the next three years we had to do a brand new car for the V6 yeah. The MP44. Then a year later, we had to do a car for the normally aspirated engine as well, and we had to do a test mule with the MP44 to run the normally aspirated engine. So I had, I had three, four cars 
in the three years. And I had to pick, therefore, I had to pick, for the first time in my life, I had chief designers. You know, I had people that right. could lead right. the program. I, never, I always had to do everything myself, or me and David North. Mm -hmm. um, I never had this many people. That we, I think we had about 10 people in the design office. I mean, it's a massive team for me after, after Brabham. <laughs> and uh, so I picked Neil Oatley to work on the NA program and Steve to work on the Turbo program. Right. But... I was in charge of every single element of the design. I let the team get on with the stuff I wasn't changing. So yeah. things like the monocoque yeah. and the bodywork and stuff, you know, th we had a very good guy on aero. Um, that I let the team just get on with. But all the new stuff, the biggest change in the car was the, was the engine package and the gearbox and the back end and the aero around the, the rear diffuser. Mm. And the front suspension, which was my pull rod and roller that I'd first used in, um, the Brabham Alpha B48, as opposed to the McLaren system. So, yeah, I mean, why, if you think about it, I mean, it's, it's, it's such a, there's so much rubbish being written about this, but if, why would I arrive from Brabham with two world championships, take a three year break from car design, and then go and do the McLaren F1? Mm. You know, it's, it's ludicrous, the whole thing that I didn't design cars when I was at McLaren. <laughs> I think there was some sort of, I think the problem was there was a lot of bad feeling when I joined McLaren because they thought they could do it. And right. I think um, Steve was probably very put out that there was going to be another technical director because he just got rid of John. <laughs> <laughs> and John designed some very good cars. Yeah. Okay. Um, the F1, um, we'll, we'll, we'll segue into that. John Saviano um, has asked, uh, if you're asked to do the McLaren F1 over again, what would you do differently? I'll, I'm going to add something to that. When, when we did a story, when I was at Evo and we did a story with you on the F1, we the intro to the the feature was a picture of you pointing. I think oh, a little bracket. bracket. Oh God, yeah, <laughs> that still <laughs> drives me mad whenever I see a car. Yeah, <laughs> that's it, absolutely that. true. That's absolutely true. That's apart from upgrading to modern technology, which I'll come back right, to, right. Um, that's absolutely true because I signed off every, I was fanatical about signing off every single drawing because obviously I didn't draw the whole car myself. I had a team of uh, six people drawing bits. And, uh, but I signed off every single drawing. And the car had already been signed off and we handed it over to production engineers. Yeah. And there was a final test at Bruntingthorpe, a high speed run and they noticed that the engine uh, bay light kept flickering on and off. And what it was, we had a little a beautiful uh, machined aluminium bracket with a micro switch that when you opened the engine cover, put the engine bay light on. And the suction over the top of the car at 130, 140 miles an hour was, was bowing that slightly and the light was coming on. And somebody decided that they would make, a, I hate brackets anyway. <laughs> I, I really hate brackets. <laughs> Even now I walk around and go, you know, don't make that bit do the work. Don't add a bracket to it to do the work. And uh, somebody had made a steel, I mean steel for a start, bracket, and bolted it to this beautiful bit of, to extend the micro switch so it didn't come brave on. person. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't see it until the car went into production. Uh. So every single McLaren F1, has that bracket on it, and it's just dreadful. I'm surprised you don't go around s just unscrewing them. Uh, well, I, I one, did you know. think, I was so <laughs> incensed, I did actually think about redesigning it and <laughs> posting every person a bracket. In fact, one, one owner made one for me and came and presented it to me. Did he? Made a new bracket, oh. all machined out of aluminium, and I still got it somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Fan, uh, F1, a question again from Michael G. Um, the F1 had fan-assisted aero. Did this work like the BT46B? And how strong was the effect in this application? I'm curious because you never see fan cars on the road. Yeah. No, it wasn't at all like the 46B. Um, what it was, was we had, doing a diffuser, the, the F1 was the first ground effect road car, which is uh, you encourage there under the front rather than trying to exclude it like a, a, the spoiler or yeah. skirt. And then you have a flat bottom and then you have a diffuser which expands the air and you, you encourage the air to speed up and you have uh, in the Venturi area you have low pressure and you get ground effect. And it was the first car to use that. The problem is with a road car, the lower wishbones are right in the way of where the diffuser wants to be. So you can't have a nice big diffuser. 
and you have to be quite gradual. So the ground effect is actually not that effective on most road cars. So what we did was we had, uh, we had fans on the car anyway yeah. for cooling the engine bay, electric fans, and for cooling the DC-DC converter for the electric screen. Um, so I, r I sucked the air f for those fans from the front part of the diffuser. So the diffuser, instead of being gradual, takes a huge step. Mm. And we, you remove the boundary layer and you encourage the air to stick to the uh, diffuser so you can get much more dramatic, which okay. gives you more downforce. Yeah. So uh, what happens is the fans are controlled by several things. If the DC-DC converter gets too hot, they come on. If the engine bay goes above 60 degrees centigrade, they come on. And if the car does more than 60 miles an hour, they go on. And th the effect is noticeable, but not huge like the fan car, but it's, it's rarely noticeable. So it's something probably in the order of 10, 15% more downforce right. over a standard diffuser. Did the race car keep the, the fans? Was, was it allowed to? to no. Right, okay. No, we had to get rid of Stick those. wings on it. Because it was a movable aerodynamic device. Yeah. Okay. I, don't, I don't think initially there was any plan, was there, for the F1 to go racing? Not no, at all. No, no, but, but when, when, it, when the racing version was adapted, I mean, how confident were you that it was going to perform well at the morning 95? Well, on, on the contrary, I, I was adamant when we, I sat down with Mansour Auger and Ron in the beginning and I said, I'm a racing car designer. If you want me to do a road car, which is effectively a GT, it had to have luggage and air conditioning and sound system and stuff. Please don't make me do a racing car because I'll compromise and I wanted it to be an absolute no compromise road car. So I was annoyed when we got bullied into doing it by Ray Belm for the 95 championship. I was annoyed that my decision had been overturned. I was worried because I thought, now if I had known it was gonna go racing, I probably would have had longer overhangs for aerodynamics, for example. Um, and I was worried because you know, racetrack the loads on the car, we put a wing on it, and for a, for a road car, the size of bolts and things that held the suspension on were absolutely the smallest they could possibly be, so I was worried as well. So I had all these mixed emotions. Having said that, when we went racing, um, I, I'd forgotten that subconsciously I am a racing car designer, <laughs> and the thing was very stiff torsionally, aerodynamically it was good, had ground effect aerodynamics. Um, it was very light, and the suspension geometry was pretty good. Um, very, almost no compromise in the suspension geometry. And the engine was stonking anyway, um, from a torque delivery point of view and a power delivery. In fact, we had to detune it to go racing. It was that powerful. Um, so it was a pleasant surprise, I suppose, but I was worried about it before we went racing. This is a, there are a technical question. This is Peter from Canada. I, I suspect Peter is, is an engineer. Um, why does the static pressure increase in the middle of flat F1 floors? Why doesn't the pressure decrease from the leading edge of the floor to the diffuser inlet? Can separation occur at the leading edge of the floor? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Those cars hardly had any rake, did they not, in the 80s and the early 90s? Okay. <laughs> That's not a problem. When you have a flat floor, as opposed to going back to the Lotus wing car, which is a continuous wing shape yes. with a very well-defined, or any of the wing cars in the 80s, 70s and 80s, um, had a very well-defined Venturi, where you had a lead-in to the Venturi and a, and a long diffuser. So you squeezed the air against the ground, sped the air up, and got low pressure. That's how it works, basically. But with a flat floor car, it's much more difficult. And the question is absolutely, um, it's a good question. And he's right, because the lead-in, uh, when you have air approaching a bluff object, which, a, which mm -hmm. a car is, you have what we call a stagnation point. So you have a slice of air, an imaginary slice of air, and it feels the bluff form coming. And below that, all the air that wants to go from that slice wants to go under the car. Yeah. And the air above it wants to go over the car. That's called a stagnation point. So with a ground effect car, the bit that's going under the car, obviously is compressible at that speed. And it, t it dives off towards the edge, the lower lip of the car. And if that's a sharp edge, 
like a an air dam, yeah. lip sticking out, you have separation. And that separation never really recovers. So okay. your, your flat bottom and your diffuser don't work very efficiently. So you'll find all the good ground effect cars with flat bottom have a slight, have a curved front and a slight parabolic curve coming back to the, uh, yeah. <laughs> the French <laughs> the curves French again. Curves. Number, number yeah, six. Number yeah. six curve again. <laughs> and, and that encourages the air to stay attached. And what you get then is the air speeding up and it's, it's, it gets squeezed, if you like, and sped up after its initial, um, if you imagine the slug of air below that separation point is maybe 300 mil high, now it's gonna get squeezed to 100 mil, so it's speeding up. And that's your effective Venturi, even though it's a flat floor. Mm. And then you slow the air down again at the end um, into the base suction behind the car. But with a flat floor, you get boundary layer buildup, which makes, if you can imagine a wedge of dead air starting uh, on the surface of the underbody of the car, and that wedge gets bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah. which completely destroys the area where you want the low pressure to be. So then you run rake. Right. So every flat lift. bottom car yeah. has to run rake. Yeah. And that cancels the wedge of um, boundary layer. Yeah. So you can de determine by the rake of the car where your low pressure area is going to be, to a certain extent. Nowadays, aerodynamics would be taught as a completely separate subject. Where did you pick yours up? I just always have been fascinated in aerodynamics. I loved aeroplanes, Second World War aeroplanes. And I've loved the development of aeroplanes and the supermarine, high speed uh, car, uh, planes from the 30s. That's where I got the surface cooling idea from, was the, oh, the supermarine planes. Yeah. Yeah. And I've always just loved aerodynamics, uh, been fascinated with it. So we used to experiment a lot. The BT-44 in 1974 had a crude form of ground effect with a sacrificial V underneath it. And I tested it with a, a water manometer at Carl Army and found we producing 100 pounds of downforce under the car. Designed, that was, that was your intention from yep. the start. Right, okay. Yep. okay. Speaking of aerodynamics, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to mention the word halo because Anthony Jenkins, our reader, has suggested gorgeous aesthetics have always been a trademark of your F1 creations. What do you think of the halo? What do you think the halo will do for F1 aesthetics in 2018? Oh, I mean, put a fan on. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, don't get me going on modern F1 aesthetics. I mean, they're completely driven by detailed design. For me, the cars have a technical beauty, but yep. there's no proportion. Uh, with a Formula One car and all the little bits and pieces that stick up off the main surface. It's, it's a bit like you've got a, a racing car that could look quite good and then you camouflage it with lots of bits sticking out all over the place so the halo is just another one of those. It's a, it's a rather inelegant solution as well. Uh, Surely if, yeah, it was given, if, if, if you or the, some, some of the, the top guys in form, involved in Formula One were asked to deliver a halo, it, you, the car has to have a halo, the driver needs a halo, so come up with your ideas. Yeah. You wouldn't put a flip-flop on the no. cockpit, would you? <laughs> I certainly <laughs> wouldn't, no. <laughs> right, okay, we are, we are coming towards the end, I'm, I'm afraid, and I'm, I'm hoping that I've got through a lot of the questions. We have answered many of the questions in here. Um, I'm gonna go back to Le Mans McLaren. Renato Guarda, would you like to design another car for Le Mans? Would you prefer, if so, would you prefer a GT or a prototype? I love Le Mans, actually. I, I've only... Um, I, I first went to Le Mans 72 and I designed the three litre prototype for Alan Academy, Chris Crafter Drive. Yeah. And uh, then I didn't go back until 95, but only because I was, uh, 95, yeah, with the F1, uh, only because I was massively busy, um, firstly with uh, Formula One and then secondly setting up in McLaren and designing the F1. Um, I love uh, GT racing and, yeah. and Le Mans. I think, I'd, li I'd love to go back and, and do some racing again, a sports car racing, and I'm hoping we can one day. But I'm not sure about the direction the prototypes are going. I actually worked very closely with the ACO for six years, some time ago, to try and, try and get back to the top class being more road car based okay. and away from prototypes or such extreme prototypes yeah, yeah. where it was like a two, a two division race, if you like. Um, because I thought that's, that was the roots of Le Mans. Mm. 
And although there's certain uh, groups of people who expect extreme prototypes, not as extreme as we've got now. I mean, they're basically mm -hmm. closed in Formula One cars. Yeah. yeah. Um, and hugely expensive to to yeah. bring to the race yeah. and of course the the disaster there is you only need one or two people to stop and your and your whole concept of the of the entry profile uh, changes yeah, as we've seen. so yeah. i try to i try to get them to um to do two things i try to get them to bring gt cars back and have them much more important again mm. and to maybe restrict the prototype so they weren't that much quicker on downforce because yeah. um, they're very slow on the straights. I think the F1 was quicker than this year's winning car mm. on the straight. Mm. Um, and the other thing I tried to get them to do from the point of view of developing new technology, rather than let the prototypes get carried away with that, which is massively expensive, and maybe in a direction that road cars couldn't follow, I, got, I, I suggested that maybe they bring back the index of performance and you and you make that almost as important as winning the race. So in other yeah, words, yeah. for any given car, the total energy you use for the distance travelled, you could win a cup that was almost big as the yeah. the winning cup, and start start to make that important again. Yeah. And I think that would drive people for not just engine technology, but more efficient motor cars. Yeah, yeah. You okay. said you'd love to get back to some racing. Did you mm. mean behind the wheel or behind a team? Actually, both. Both, because um, while I still can <laughs> at this age, um, I, I had the good fortune, uh, Charles March asked me to, um, to bring my T1, my first IGM4, the little racing car, to Goodwood, and I ran it up the hill at the Festival of Speed, and wow, <laughs> that was pure nostalgia. I was 19 again, you know, the, the noise, the smell, the way the car handled, the steering feel, everything came back to me. And I thought, well, it'd be fun to do some uh, mm. hill climbs or something with that. Um, and then I've just built a recreation of the Brabham BT44, uh, BT4044B, I've just made one. And uh, I'd love to drive that too. Because I used to drive all the Formula One cars up until the BT48. And then we lost our tall drivers and I made the monocoque three inches short and I couldn't fit anymore. <laughs> Stupidly, <laughs> didn't think of that. So the last Grand Prix car I drove was the V12 BD48 Carl Army. Yeah. Did, you, did you have a run in the Fanco? No, no shame, I didn't, no. But, um, so I'd like to, yeah, that would be fun. Uh, how much of a fist did you make of driving an F1 car? I mean, I didn't go to high speed testing, but I, I just drove them to see what they felt like. I wanted to see what carbon brakes felt like, for example, the feedback from the brake pedal. And, and uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been anywhere near competitive on lap times, but I, it was good to drive all the cars and see the engine management and, you know, the power delivery and stuff like that. I'd like to, um, I'd like to find out what, how the Rocket, the light car company Rocket, um, how, where does that sit in your your kind of your list of favourites? I, lo I love the car, just the, the principle, the, the way, the way <laughs> <Yes>. it looks. <laughs> I wish there was a one make series for it. I'd love to. Have seen there nearly was. Rock. Was there? There nearly was. Oh, just, that's just Chris Craft. <laughs> Chris Craft came within a gnats of actually getting, uh, with the blessing of Max Mosley wow. and even Bernie, I think, from memory, um, of having a one make series and supporting a few of the Grand Prix. Oh, can you imagine? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all different coloured motor cars buzzing yeah. around at 11,500 yeah. revs. I mean, it would have been fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, I'm still, I still love that car for two reasons. Um, because again, going back, to, sorry, keeps going back to Colin Chapman, but it miffed me that the Lotus 7, which later became the Catrim, was still the world's lightest road car at 500 kilos. Really upset me. So I had a target of 350 kilos, mm. but it was going to be a single seater. Chris Craft, who was going to build the cars and funded it, um, wanted it to be a tandem two seater. So we lost 20 kilos, so we were 370. Um, but it's still, as far as I know, still the lightest road car out there. But the other thing I like about it is if anybody ever wants to know what lightweight does for vehicle dynamics, I just say, get in the car and drive it because mm. you can't believe how it steers, turns in, and brakes. Um, and, and you can four-wheel drift it. That it's, it's on road tires where the compound is much too hard yeah. for the weight of the car, which is fantastic on a high-speed circuit like Goodwood. You can four-wheel drift it all around the lap. Yeah. But there was a 
parallel side by side two seater in the design lightning. as well. The yes. lightning, yes, yeah, and, <coughs> and one of your ghost cars. And happily, happily, yeah. Um, Chris had a chassis because I said to Chris, "It's going to look a bit empty after the rocket. I'm going to have the lightning drawings up and stuff." And he said, oh, "I've got a chassis. You know, have the chassis." So we we had the chassis there. We built the engine. We did a one-off with Russell Savory. We did a one-off V8. 2 litre V8 using two Yamaha FZR cylinder heads with our own crank, dry sump, fuel injected, 305 horsepower, 10,000. And the car was going to weigh 560 kilos, 300 horsepower. So that's one I do want to finish one day. Right. Definitely got to finish that. Watch that space. Okay. I think that's, I think that's a great place to end it. Well, it's not actually. We, I'm sure we could talk <laughs> forever. And especially now I'm thinking of bike engines with yeah um, but yeah let's, let's not go there I just I just I think I've just seen a vision of your next <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe you might be closer than okay. you think okay <laughs> it's, it's, it's a I want to see him finish a two stroke V12 that's the, uh, that's, <laughs> the that's, that's what I'm fully looking forward to hearing Absolutely, certainly yeah <laughs> it's been a pleasure thank you so Hello, much thank for you. joining us thank on you. the Royal Automobile Club oh, it's been fun show. yeah we've really enjoyed it thank you very much to Gordon and to Simon as well from, from the thank you guys team. Yeah. Um, thanks you for, for you for, for listening as well um, we've had some amazing questions for, for this talk show please stay in touch with us uh, on the website motorsportmagazine.com we've got some great talk shows coming up and um, the questions have been magnificent and thanks very much to Gordon to, to answering them in, in such detail so we'll see you um, at the next uh, Royal Automobile Club talk show. Thank you very much.